Um, so our first question for you, Carol, is just if you could speak a little bit about your background as an artist and a geologist. Sure, thank you, Genevieve. Um, well, going way back, my interest in geology started in grade eight science class. <laughs> and uh, it, it was uh, an introductory geology course. And my sister at the same time worked in Yoho National Park. So I grew up in Calgary. And, uh, and I remember being on Emerald Lake and looking up at the mountain and I was explaining to her that that was a cirque and I know how that's formed. That was from the glaciers. And I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. And I think it was that day that I decided I want to be a geologist. And so um, that came before my interest in art. Art for me, um, I was one of those high school kids that lived in the art room. That was my sanctuary. And I had the best art teacher ever. And uh, so yeah, by the time I finished high school, I was ready to go to University of Calgary to uh, do a degree in geology. I was a little bit torn, art, geology, but uh, that desire to understand where I am really in, um, in the big picture, what's under my feet, just never left me. So, And then the art classes, I just kept taking any art class I could while uh, I worked seasonally as a geologist. Great, yeah. Well, and, and that curious, sense of curiosity serves both, both of those um, professions well, doesn't it? So um, what type of projects uh, in the geology field have you been involved with? Uh, mostly my geology work, it, well, early days, it was all uh, bedrock mapping for various government agencies like the Geological Survey of Canada was right across from the street from the University of Calgary. And being in Calgary, most of the students wanted to work downtown in oil and gas. And so I had my pick of the best summer field jobs. So I got to go to Ellesmere Island and work near Atlin uh, in Northern BC around Tagish Lake. And uh, our work involved just um, trying to cover as much ground as possible and making geology maps. So uh, we would be picked up by helicopter with all our camp and set out every three or four days. And uh, it was an amazing job. When I look back now, it's, <laughs> I knew it was amazing then, but now I just think that was, that was an incredible experience. And then um, I ended up in the Yukon working seasonally, like six months in the, you're up there continuing geologic bedrock mapping for the Yukon government. I did that for three years. And then uh, I started my own company doing geomorphology, mostly for forestry and uh, landslide stability assessment work and terrain mapping. And uh, so I guess I stopped doing that in 2008 and have been working on art. Cool. So just for those of us who um, don't have a science background, can you, in a nutshell, explain what geomorphology is? It's more about surficial geology. So I'm studying the soil more than the rock itself. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, Carol, I guess a question that comes to mind, hearing about that kind of amazing sounding careers of geologists, and all the travels you were able to, and places you were able to experience with that work. What pulled you from that into art or how did you find kind of a bridge from that work into your, your art practice, which is primarily what you occupy your time with now, right? Yeah, I, um, well, I had children and so I wanted to be home. So that was, and I always knew like when I decided I, to, go into geology instead of art, I always thought, oh, I, I'll just do art later. Like when I'm old and 30 years old, that's when I'll do art. Cause that was really old back then. <laughs> and I think I waited till I was in my mid forties to really commit to art. But, um, but yeah, when I, so, so I, when I first started getting back into art more full time, I struggled a little bit with my subject matter what should I, and I was a painter mostly. And so I was always trying to figure out what should I paint? And 
and uh, and it didn't feel like it was felt like work. And then I started thinking about um, when I was on Ellesmere Island, there was this experience of walking through this stratigraphy, which was from, um, it was in Permian sediments. And we actually crossed the largest extinction boundary ever on this planet. And the rocks basically looked the same. And you had to just look closely to see what the fossils were. And over as you walk up this, this section of rock, you could see the transition um, from warmer climate to cooler climate. And you could see the fossils changing. The rock looked the same, but then there were no fossils above that layer. And uh, so there was this significance about this layer. It's so subtle, but it was such a massive extinction event. And the um, fellow I was working with at the time, we started thinking about what would our layer look like mm -hmm. um, when we're long gone? And uh, we were joking about how it'd be fluorescent green or something like this. And, and that came back to me not that long ago. And I, I wanted to see if I could capture that in, in the imagery of that, what our layer would look like. And I did a series called The Green Layer with a lot of geologic imagery. And I just felt like it came so naturally. There was so much material, um, all that from, from my past that uh, I found my subject matter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it is, I guess, geology is a very visual field, isn't it? Just mm -hmm. like art, so yeah. So now here we are, the three of us, we're all based um, in the Kootenays. Um, can you tell us anything about the geological history of the East and West Kootenays? Sure, it's complicated, <laughs> but I can I can give you a um, just the general uh, tectonic setting of what's called the Canadian Cordillera, and um, what's really interesting about our area is that we are really on the edge of uh, continental North America and exotic terrain. So um, actually, I'm going to just uh, share my screen with you so I can just show you. OK. So you see that? It's on a different monitor for me. Is it working? You can see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, this picture here is 420 million years ago. So this is the rock that we would consider the Canadian Shield. And the shoreline is right um, in Alberta. So there's nothing in British Columbia yet. And, uh, but over probably a period of 500 million years, you have sediments, uh, depositing onto the West Coast at this time, along the edge of ancient North America. So not much is happening at this now, time period, except a lot of material is getting dumped off the edge. I'm, I forgot to, or maybe I wasn't listening, but what time range is that in exactly? How many? Well, this one is about 420 million years ago. Okay. So just before this was the Burgess Shale. So you're underwater in this part of Alberta. Um, okay, in this time period, we're now into the Triassic, 245 million years ago. Wow. So this is still Canadian Shield, the edge of North America, but you have these islands out in the Pacific. And so along the edge, there's a subduction zone where ocean crust is being consumed by the continental, the continent. So the North American continent is moving to the West. And because ocean crust is dense, more dense, it's going under. And all those islands are squishing into ancient North America. And they're folding, they're faulted, they're, they're stacked up on each other and it's getting really, really thick. And it's a lot of volcanic rock. So like, as I drive from Nelson to Weimar, I'm driving through volcanic rock. Oh, wow. So I'm sitting in Nelson, I'm looking up 
at Elephant Mountain and it's mostly granitic rock. And that granitic rock is the intrusive or igneous body of rock that's underneath the volcano wow. where, where ocean floor and continental crust is melting and recrystallizing to form the granitic rock. And does intrusive mean, like when you say that, is that the rock that moves up from underneath? Like, so from the oceanic plate? So, into the, um, so intrusive is, yeah, so, um, okay, I just, so maybe I shouldn't use that word just to keep it simple. So there, the igneous rock is the, um, the granitic pluton. Okay. And on top of a granitic pluton is usually the volcano. Oh, okay. So that's where it's mantle coming out the surface, volcanic activity. But underneath, there's this body of igneous rock. So, so as I move on, this is uh, those islands that are um, have been squished into the continent. There's this uh, inland sea, and now we're uh, in the Jurassic, 170 million years ago. So dinosaurs are roaming around, and uh, this is pro probably below this landmass is where the Nelson batholith is actually being formed. Oh, cool! Deep under under this landmass here. So, and then eventually more islands collide into British Columbia. And that's, uh, so there's several series of these volcanic arcs, arcs that have um, squished into ancient North America. So, and I, yeah, that's the, uh, I'll just stop sharing here. And so by the time they've squished in, they're no longer volcanic anymore. Is that correct? Or are they still? Well, the 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 uh, subduction zone keeps kind of stepping back, right? right? So you get this this landmass coming in, and then um, yeah. So it's just it's it's really complicated, but it's the the environment is still like this too, where you have ocean crust going under uh, con recent continental crust so right and so the the you have the rockies which are so um steep and rocky <laughs> and then yes, the, the youngest mountains yeah so all that stacking and thrusting has there's really really deep long thrust faults that just keep uh moving toward the uh all the way to alberta yeah I find this so fascinating because, I mean, I think when I went to school, the, the theory of plate tectonics was just kind of getting formed. And, and you know, and I think so many of us think of the, the, the earth that we stand on as being this solid mass. You know, it's the one thing in our life that's um, unshakable. <laughs> but of course... <laughs> It isn't. <laughs> it's just mind blowing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I think what I, I keep thinking of Carol is like, I love talking to you about this stuff, even though I never fully understand what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> but I feel like what's so amazing to me is that I can tell from the way you're speaking that you have this like internal map kind of um, complicated three-dimensional understanding of this region and its geology. And I feel like that's obviously from your, your geologic work, but it translates into the artistic work you're making. Even when you were painting in a two-dimensional space, there was that sense of map-like or three-dimensionality, and especially mm -hmm. in the sculptural um, and installation work that you're gonna be presenting in Oakwood. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It's so interesting. Um, I'm still learning so much. It's so complicated. So, yeah, and I imagine that that kind of project of of taking what's in your mind and translating it out. I mean, artists, I think, often have that, but but 
for you, I imagine there's this whole other layer because of your geolog, your the information you carry around geology. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, another question we have is, um, of course, this region is, has been mined a lot of um, copper and silver um, and what else? Coal Lead. and graphite <laughs> and lead. Um, so there, this area is definitely noted for its mining in the past and present. Um, what accounts for these deposits, these heavy metal deposits in this region? Well, again, it's all related to this dynamic environment of uh, the colliding tectonic plates because you need a heat source and you, you need um, enriched fluid to move. So if you have you have the heat source and you have the faults that are created uh, from compression or extension, um, then you have mineral deposits because the, the fluids, um, whether or not it's water or uh, silica is moving through the cracks. And then as it hits a certain temperature, they solidify. Mm. And yeah, that's speaking generally about the mining in this area without getting into detail of different kinds of deposits. <laughs> it's a huge topic. <laughs> answer the question. Yeah. yeah. But the um, faults really are like this space between two pieces of rock or geology. That's right. A crack where the fluid can move. Right. Yeah. Okay, and and you mentioned already the Nelson Batholith, and uh, that's a fairly large uh, layer here. Can you, uh, you and you've used it as a source for your current work, um, which we'll get to see um, either virtually or in person. So, what can you tell us about this Nelson Batholith? Uh, okay, so the Nelson Batholith is. If you've ever heard of um, the word pluton, like there's the Bonington pluton, so that's all granitic rock, and then there's the Nelson, and um, those are all bodies within the Nelson batholith. So the Nelson batholith, batholith <laughs> encompasses all the different phases of this one igneous intrusion. And uh, so I got a hold of all these thin sections that were collected in the Nelson Batholith. And uh, thin sections are um, 0.03 millimeter slices of a rock sample mounted onto a glass plate yeah. so that you can look at the rock under a petrographic microscope, which is, uh, it's a special microscope with light refraction and you can do mineral identification. And that is, rocks look completely different when you look at, uh, at uh, this. And I'm just gonna share my screen again so I can show you what I'm talking about. Okay, so you see the, did it work? No, I have to press share. There we go. Okay, so these are what the thin sections look like. Mm. And, uh, they're, the fine grain ones are um, lamplier dikes that cross cut through the Nelson Batholith, and I'm I'm not going to get into the detail about those. But the this this kind of texture, this is all uh, um, different phases of the granitic rock. You have what's called mafic phases, where you have lots of uh, dark colored minerals, and then you have lighter phases. So it's like is there ocean crust mixed in this? Is this continental crust mixed in this? And it just, it's like baking, right? <laughs> <laughs> Different ingredients, it's all chemistry. So um, I'm just gonna show you some pictures of what some of these thin sections look like under the microscope. So this wow. is uh, this bright green color, that's actually muscovite, which I don't know if you know, muscovite is a black mineral the platy mineral that you see in granitic rock. Huh. And, uh, and the gray material here, that's all quartz. 
and so in an intrude the the biotite looks like this also because when this the Nelson batholith was being deposited or it was moving it was moving um it has a lot of uh fabric in it so texture that show the minerals get stretched as they're um as they're solidifying so it's like a crystal mush some minerals have already crystallized some are still in solution and it yeah so you get these different fabrics and uh this next one this is a feldspar crystal wow with, you know, with these striations and and all around it is the quartz minerals so that's one feldspar crystal that's amazing yeah and this one here this is a perthite which is a type of feldspar and this is the um quartz and That's... then this i believe this is uh crushed up biotite so so when when geologists are using these to identify the minerals are they looking at the molecular structure that then creates those patterns or it's uh there's all these different little tricks when you're doing optical mineralogy um i yeah it's it's too complicated to get into <laughs> that's that's amazing how much color there is like when you're looking when you showed us the slides they they looked very you know white gray black but yeah. there's the colors just stunning yeah, yeah. and the shapes mm -hmm. and i think there's this like I can't wait to see them projected large, but I imagine they have that play where they look like um, they could be microscopic or they could be vast landscapes at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. No, it's pretty exciting. It's uh, I'm still so fascinated looking at all these different samples. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess another question we have um is it's clear that geology informs your your artistic work does art inform your geologic understanding the more your practice changes and develops definitely oh, sorry this is such a great question <laughs> um i i think for me i'm i'm starting to see all the patterns and textures differently whereas before it was always information it was like what does it mean what does it mean and now i see the art in it and uh the like you said the colors and just see it for what it is mm -hmm. and yeah that's that's mostly it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. Like almost rather than looking at myopically, you're kind of seeing the bigger picture a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. So some of the slides that you were showing us, Louis, like if I created those in, as an artist, I would be so thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I'm just illustrating what's already there. What's right, what, what we're surrounded by when you look really close. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so much of this for me is it's it's a passion I have for geology. And at one point, I really wanted to teach introductory geology. And so it feels like it's bringing everything together, my art, this desire to share this knowledge and the science. So that it's working for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's I think it's working for viewers too because it's so interesting to get a window into some of the more kind of hard science as well as how you're uh, expressing it artistically so well, thanks genevieve we're so happy to have you as part of this exhibition and yeah we thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today we really appreciate it oh my pleasure and i'm so honored to be part of this group show thank you